Now we have to learn about these different types of particles they're talking about, alpha, beta, and gamma particles. Now the alpha, beta, and gamma particles come from, they're emitted when there's a radioactive decay. But what does radioactive decay mean of the nucleus? Well, some nuclei are unstable. That means that if you have an unstable nucleus, it only lasts for a while, and then it turns into something else. An unstable nucleus decays into something else, and when it decays, it emits particles. Mm -hmm. And there's different types of particles that can be emitted. One type of particle is an alpha particle. Now, it turns out that alpha particles are actually helium nucleuses. Alpha particles are actually helium nucleuses, so what would be the Z number? Two. Two. And it turns out that helium nucleuses have a mass number of four. So there's two good ways to write an alpha particle. You could write it with the symbol alpha, or you could write it with the helium symbol. These are the same thing. So we need to keep in mind that that is what a alpha particle is. Then there are beta particles. It turns out that beta particles are electrons. Beta particles are electrons. So what are the Z and the A numbers for a beta particle? Um, negative one and zero. The Z is negative one, because an electron is a charge of negative one. And the atomic number, uh, I'm sorry, the mass number is approximately zero. Not really zero, but it's so small that we treat it like zero. So you could write a beta particle either of these two ways. These would both indicate that they have electrons. Right. Well, they're really not. Uh, they're really not using the same convention. So, in your periodic table, in your periodic table, they write something like this. Mm -hmm. This is just a totally different convention. So, the way to see that we're, we're using this convention is when the numbers are superscripts and subscripts that are off to the left. Uh -huh. This is just a totally different convention over here. That's why they gave you the key to tell you what the numbers meant above and below. Also. So, yeah, what does number does this represent, Z or A? That is A, no Z. Because remember that the, the table tells you to treat the top number as the atomic number. Yeah. So in your periodic table, this number was the atomic number. But what does this represent? It doesn't represent Z or A. Oh. This is what they call the atomic mass. And even though they sound the same, the atomic mass is a different concept from the mass number. Okay. Well, why are they different? Well. Remember that every element has a bunch of different isotopes. Mm -hmm. For example, here we said that the mass of this isotope was 1, the mass of this isotope was 2. However, the masses in the periodic table are averages of the isotopes. So they take an average of the isotopes that occur in nature to get this atomic number over here. But that's not something that's going to be too useful to us in this chapter. We don't want to have an average of all the naturally occurring isotopes. We want to know the actual mass of the actual isotope that we're looking at. So actually, the atomic mass or the atomic weight is not really the same concept as the mass number of a nucleus. So we're really not going to use these numbers from the table. We're not going to be using these numbers, just the atomic numbers. I don't know if you've heard about the concept that besides ordinary matter, every particle also has an antimatter antiparticle. It turns out that every particle that exists corresponds to an antimatter antiparticle. So what's the relationship between a particle and an antiparticle? Well, a particle and an antiparticle are kind of the same but opposite. So they have the same mass but opposite charge. Things are antiparticles if they have the same mass but opposite charge. And we need to focus on the antiparticle for an electron, an anti-electron. Anti-electron. Another name for an anti-electron is a positron. Since it's the antiparticle to a beta particle, you can also use the symbol beta for a positron. At least sometimes that's done. Well then, if this is the antiparticle for an electron, what would be the z and the a numbers? Negative one and zero. What are the z and the a numbers for an electron? Negative one and zero. Okay, and now we have to figure out the z and the a numbers for the anti-electron. Do you remember, how is an antiparticle similar to the regular particle, and how are they different? The opposite. Opposite of what? Uh, Let's go over that again. An antiparticle has the same mass as a particle, but the opposite charge. Uh, 
oh. antiparticles have the same mass as the particle that they correspond oh. to, but the opposite charge. It's zero and one. That's right, zero and positive one. And again, we're really getting into the habit here of interpreting Z as charge. We can't just interpret it as number of protons when we're dealing with other subatomic <coughs> particles, but we can interpret Z as a charge. Now again, a positron doesn't literally have zero mass, but the mass is very small, so we can approximate it as zero. So this would be a good symbol for a positron. And there's a couple other symbols that might sometimes be used to show the difference between a electron beta particle and a positron beta particle. Sometimes people might put a negative sign here to show this is the negative version and a positive symbol here to show that's the positive version. So beta plus would stand for a positron, which is an anti-electron. And beta minus would just stand for a normal electron. Then we have gamma particles. Gamma particles are photons of light. Gamma particles are high frequency photons. Remember that photons are the particle interpretation for electromagnetic radiation. So gamma, another name for a gamma particle is a gamma wave. Remember that we can, because of wave particle duality, sometimes it helps to think of these as gamma particles, and sometimes it helps to think of them as gamma waves. But they're a type of high frequency photon, so they're part of the same electromagnetic spectrum as radio waves or visible light or ultraviolet light. Well, let's figure out what the numbers would be for a photon. Do you know what the charge is on a photon? Plus. That would be a proton. Perhaps you confused a photon and a proton there. But there's a big difference between those, right? The proton is the particle that uh, lives in the nucleus, and a photon, remember, is a particle of light. Well, how much mass does light have? Zero. Yeah, zero. You might have noticed that the light, uh, when light hits you, it doesn't seem to weigh anything. It doesn't seem to take any effort to support light. So light has a mass number of zero. And this is not approximate. This is exact. The light has zero mass. Light has zero mass, exactly zero mass. And do you know what the charge is on a photon? Um, no. Now, would you say that light is positively charged, positive. negatively charged, or neutral? Neutral? Yeah. Doesn't it make sense that light is really neutrally charged? We don't normally think of, of get, getting hit by light as something that's going to give you a charge. After all, you're getting hit by light right, right now, but you're not accumulating any charge from that. So the numbers for gamma particles are, in a sense, very simple. Simple. They have zero charge and zero mass. A gamma particle has zero charge and zero mass. So we're doing problems and getting ready for the exam. It's important to memorize or have in your cheat sheet what the characteristics are of each of these particles, alpha particles, beta particles, and gamma particles. We need to know what their charges and their masses are.